so this just came out. It was, I think, came out in January, December, January. It had some advanced copies. Um, and it's, it, for us, it's a conversation starter. We've been working on this topic for a long time, as I'm sure many of you have. Um, and we haven't ever really found a great structure to have the conversation with. So this, uh, for a lot of people that were involved in the writing, thought that uh, it would be a good way to organize it a little bit. Uh, so when you start to organizing, it's always fun to create a duality. So obviously there's mitigation, which is the reductionist framework, and then there's adaptation, the resilience kind of conversation. But that expands into a lot of other things. So this book um, covers on the mitigative side everything from zero net energy buildings to climate positive communities, uh, the science of climate change, what do we know or think we know, uh, the psychology of choice, how we make choices. Uh, on the adaptation side, that needed a bit more of an introduction, so we put some kind of core content. What is adaptation, adaptation planning? Uh, how does it relate to vulnerability, resilience? Um, and then looked at some particular communities, because that should be something that is locally, locally driven. Uh, so we have seen a lot of historical work, precedent investment, in the mitigation side, the greenhouse gas reduction side. Welcome, you guys. Come on in. I heard that Vancouver people are always late to these things. <laughs> but you still get a bookmark. There's a bookmark floating around here for you. Um, so we've globally, nationally, stateside, nationally, I think, in Canada, um, invested a lot of time and money and sweat and tears into the science conversation. I think actually quite a lot in policy. You guys have your fabulous carbon tax up here, whether everybody here thinks that's fabulous or not. Um, but not nearly as much on adaptation. So adaptation tends to be a little bit thinner overall in the amount of work that's been done. Uh, so emergent conversations we actually think are drifting away a bit from science. There's still going to be a lot of effort around science, but that's not, it seems, where uh, people are focused uh, so much. So now there's actually a lot of discussion about behavior, about how you get people to actually understand the science that's already been uh, developed. Policy still stays out there, but then there's a lot more work on the adaptation side, emergent. Um, from there, I actually do think that there's a lot of good new science, even though people kind of disregard that. I'm going to force this onto this group, because when I ask people, do you want to hear about the science, most people say no, at least when they're educated people who are engaged in it already. Like you, they say, no, I already get it. I don't need to hear more about it. Um, from my standpoint, we do need to hear more about it, because it's not static. So if you look at the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their fourth assessment report that came out in 2007, that used data from 2006 and prior. So about July 2006, I think, was their cutoff. Consensus takes a lot of time, right? That needed to go through all kinds of reviews. That means that it's old stuff. Yet it's old stuff that you today are probably using as your baseline. So this is all new stuff since well, this is actually now about a year old. I'm sure there's newer, newer stuff. Um, but we actually summarize a huge spectrum of different, about 100 different reports that have come out. But these are some of the highlights. Right now, we're looking at the science saying that the emissions are actually worse than the worst case emissions that the IPCC fourth assessment report and the, the scenario report that accompanied it said. Uh, we've got two times as much likely sea level rise and that's unevenly distributed sea level rise. Um, that there's a greater chance of catastrophic sea rise greater than 10 feet. That there's a double of prior warming estimates going upwards of five to six degrees. Um, that there's accelerating sea ice decline. You guys have probably seen that 40% 40 for, 40 faster than the average that was expected. Um, there's new research on the coral dissolution of uh, coral reefs and that those will largely start to dissolve by 560 parts per million, which is now looking kind of like mid-century, maybe even uh, a little sooner than that. And then runaway warming is more likely, uh, which means that there's positive forcings as material decomposes that actually we can't reverse what we've started. Um, and then that the changes are more likely unreversible for a long, long time. So we are put whatever descriptor you want on the end of that in a not so great place. Oh, but we should laugh. <laughs> so good, right? You gotta like watch it again. <laughs> Oh, 
I just thought you guys should laugh for a little bit, and then we can get into the rest. No, but so that is a great metaphor, right? We're on a trajectory, I would say largely irreversible to some degree. Small changes are important, right? If he could have been going not 30, 40 miles an hour, but maybe just a couple miles an hour faster. Or if we could change just a little bit, if that two degrees idea is that not just two degrees Celsius, but is it just two degrees of change, right? I mean, how, how different does our life really have to be to have a significant impact? Um, another thing I like about this is that it sets up a really good structure for how change happens and successful change. We adapted something that Jared Diamond um, originally did a few years back in his book, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed. He had it in four parts. We distilled it down to three because three is better than four. Um, and that is saying that when a society goes through some type of a threat, they need to first recognize that threat. And if they don't recognize that threat, then invariably it sneaks up and they're out of business. They collapse. Second is that they need to do more than just recognize it. They need to consciously choose to act to resolve or avoid the threat. And then the last is the need to act successfully. It's super simple, but we actually found it really valuable when we, we were developing it. Um, the reason was that one is based in precedent. You know, you look back at all these societies that have come before us, and some have collapsed, and some have been successful. And this is largely the trajectory they followed. That's why Jared Diamond came up with it. Um, it was also beneficial because I, when I was reading this, I could, I could picture people that I knew in it. Right? I could picture people that didn't recognize there was a problem at all. I could picture people that recognized that there was a problem, but would choose to do nothing about it because the problem was too big or it was somebody else's responsibility to act to solve the problem, not theirs. Um, and then there were a lot of people, probably all of us in this room, they were taking some action, but there was a real legitimate question about whether that action was effective. <clears throat> so I wanted to focus on that last one in the very short, and we've got 20 minutes, um, which is about the, the successful action. So I want to highlight going from this really negative, going to hit a, hit a two-story wall with our bicycle, um, to positive, we've got, we're much more um, sophisticated in how we're approaching both the mitigation side and the adaptation side. One way of, of uh, giving an example of that is thinking about different scales of work. So there's a lot of people probably have been familiar with all the movement for green buildings. Um, the urban, sorry, the regenerative neighborhoods conference is going on, right? So people are saying, well, buildings are the wrong scale, right? So, you can't do some things at building scale that you can do at others. The reality is that there's optimal scales for everything. But we get stuck in our politics and how we finance things and how we, how we interrelate with another to force scales on various technologies. So whether it's a room all the way up to a campus, a town, a city, or a region, there's various ways that you can overlay systems in their optimal or non-optimal status. This is an example of that. These are, I'm actually not showing you what systems these are, but these are a variety of different waste, energy, and water systems, and at what scale those systems become most optimal. Uh, so anaerobic digestion, I'll give you one example. Anaerobic digestion of organic waste sucks at a building scale. Generally don't want to do it at a building scale. That's this light green curve here, so it starts to cruise up maybe at a block, but mostly campus, town, city, and regional level. Um, Another great example is that, that it takes time, right? So we're recognizing more and more. This is from uh, Curitiba in Brazil. If people are familiar with their bus rapid transit system that is famous the world over is the best that can be. This took decades and decades to build out. So it was established. It was expanded. It was optimized over time. And then it's kind of reached this, this whether you say it's maximal potential now or it needs to maybe continue to optimize, it's, there's no way you could do what Curitiba did overnight. That's true with all of these types of systems. So we're becoming much more familiar with the idea that it takes time and that we need to make the, the first gestures, put the pipes in the ground that allow us to expand and optimize and then reach that maximal point in the future. This is saying, I'll just highlight what this is. This is basically the major, um, a movement corridor for transportation. These are the buildings that integrate with that movement corridor. Which came first? The Neither, right? They, they, they grew over time. Is the, so they're successful because of that, that basically the growth together. 
but thank you for saying that. <laughs> so um, we're also being more thoughtful about uh, behavior. So this is a great, great story about um, risk. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. So, so I'm going to give you a bet. I'm going to say it's a $100 bet. And I'm going to give you even odds on a coin toss. So I'm going to flip my quarter. Or you guys have quarters up here? OK, thank you. <laughs> flip, flip my Canadian quarter. Um, will you take my bet on even odds? So how many people take a one-to-one -one bet? So basically, I'll pay you 100 bucks if you get your, yours, or I get to keep it. OK, interesting. How about uh, 1.5 to 1? So I'll pay 150 if you give me 100. <laughs> How about 2 to 1? Jeez, come on. That's like a deal. OK, wait, so who's all here today? <laughs> You're here, come on. A little higher. <laughs> who's all here today, literally? OK, well, at least 70% of you guys are here. So I'm going to say that that was pretty good turnout. The reality when they do this study is that, that people, most people won't take the one-to-one -one bet. They won't take the 1.5 to one bet. They, a lot of folks won't even take the two to one bet. It's, a 50, it's, a, it's an even odd chance, right? So anything above one-to-one, -one, you're dumb to not take that bet, unless you don't trust me. But to say, it's a, say you trust me. And the reason for this is that, is that people hate losing. They hate losing. They hate hurt about twice as much, if you follow that analogy, about twice as much as they like feeling good or, or the, the upside risk. So how can you use that, right? You can, you can, this is just one example. But you can, to some extent, emphasize the downside risk. So that, that is, it's interesting. People are emotionally charged to respond to, to the worst scenario than they are necessarily to the optimistic, Pollyannish view of it's all going to work out. Um, there's a lot of examples like that. That was just one. This is a great equation. I love equations as an engineer. Um, and it's great because it spells mat. Uh, it comes from a fellow named B.J. Fogg in Stanford, at Stanford University who has the Persuasive Technology Lab. His is actually B equals M-A-T, behavior equals M-A-T. I did change because the book is about climate change. Change equals M-A-T and it's motivation, ability, and triggers. So you need motivated people, you need the ability to make a change, and then you need a certain trigger that either helps on one of those, either motivation, ability, or um, signaling. But if you have no motivation but all the ability in the world, you don't do anything. If you have all the motivation in the world but no ability, there's no change. So this is a great recognition because oftentimes we focus on motivating. I'm going to motivate you to change. But if you have no great ability to do that because of there's some structural issue or uh, your home life is a certain way, um, that, that you, can't, you can't necessarily do that. So thinking more sophisticatedly in a more sophisticated way about uh, behavior change. And pulling just motivation out of that equation, uh, M, uh, there is great work out there that has happened before that we should be pulling into this conversation more effectively. And who are the best motivators? Generally, they're the people that sell you stuff, right? So uh, not engineers, not architects, not policy people. They're usually the sales folks. So this is actually out of, uh, I think it's Arizona, Arizona State University, uh, Robert Cialdini, uh, who had his six weapons of persuasion or methods of persuasion. Reciprocity. You're more likely to do for someone if they have given you something. I gave you guys all bookmarks. <laughs> I would like you to buy the book. Uh, commitment. How many people would buy the book? Come on. Come on, hold your hand up really high. Okay, everybody look at everybody else. Okay, and so now that I've gotten you to commit, you're more likely to do it, even if it's reprehensible to you after the fact. <laughs> uh, social proof. Everybody else is buying the book. You should buy the book. <laughs> authority. Authority. Anybody here sitting next to their boss or somebody they respect? <coughs> Who would admit it? <laughs> okay, say you're her boss, okay? Can you just tell her to buy the book? Right? Authority. Yeah. <laughs> um, liking, if you guys like me, you're more likely to buy it. So be likable, right? Like be, be a team player, get along with people. You're more likely to get them to do things that you'd like them to do. Uh, and then scarcity. There are only four books left on Amazon. 
So they're valuable, right? So if you look at the lead rating system in green buildings, why was it successful? At the beginning, it was largely successful because of scarcity, right? It was special. Why is it successful now? It's not so special anymore. It's authority, largely. People are telling people they have to do it. It's also social proof because other people are doing it. So these things actually work really well and we're getting more sophisticated about them because we're reaching outside of the boxes of our traditional disciplines and uh, pulling from people who are expert. Uh, getting into um, adaptation, uh, specifically and vulnerability. This I think is really interesting. Everybody knows that there are hazards out there. Smoking is a classic hazard, not good for your health. Um, the reality is that those hazards have a certain severity. Smoking actually is not the most severe hazard out there. Um, what's the severe hazard? Uh, strychnine. Uh, strychnine, a poison, would be a severe hazard, but low likelihood of occurrence. So smoking, high likelihood of occurrence, a low long period of time, that's a high risk activity. Strychnine, even if you do it once or twice, high risk activity. But that's not the same thing as vulnerability because vulnerability is contextualized within a, a structure of coping ability. So how, how well can you cope with that given risk, that severity and that occurrence likelihood? And that coping ability is actually two things. People talk a lot about resilience, but it's actually two things. Resilience is the ability to recover from that bad thing that happens. So if you smoke up until 35 years old and stop, you actually have a pretty high likelihood of living out a pretty full and decent life. Your resilience after that part is really good. So you guys smoke it up. Um, <laughs> Resistance is about the ability to withstand the effects. So uh, a barrier wall, barrier seawall is a perfect resistance strategy, right? It's not about whether or not there's a breach. It's about not having a breach happen. I said that right? What happens after a breach versus whether or not a breach even happens. And those go to community characteristics and those community characteristics you can change. You can build out, you can establish, you can expand, optimize over time. Um, the hazards are what they are. This is a great example from the middle of, sorry for folks, webcast in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the US, right? So this is a small community, 500 people. Flooding in, uh, this is 2008, the entire town was submerged. So I got this story from an EPA administrator who was in the town who said, what, when was the last time your town flooded? And they said, well, yeah, there was like 91, 94, 97, I think 2000, then there was the big flood in 2003. And then it's like every three years they flood. Hyper resilient community. Because when that EPA administrator said, have you guys thought about maybe relocating? Or they said, don't even bring that up. This is where our families are from. This is our community. We, this is us. So almost no resistance to flooding, but extraordinary level of resilience. This is a lady taking a cake to some folks that are in the, flooded out area. Because the other side of this is that vulnerability is not evenly distributed. A certain community, sub-communities have more vulnerability than others. So whether that's um, impoverished, whether that's aged, whether that is uh, based on, uh, I hesitate to say this, whether you're a man or a woman in certain parts of the world, that there's differences in your ability necessarily to react to and have resilience and coping ability. Not here, obviously, but in some areas. Um, children, great example of an of a exceptionally vulnerable population in some respects. But those have, you know, you can map this, right? So you've got severity on the left, you've got occurrence likelihood on the bottom, and that allows you to prioritize your, your, your vulnerabilities based on your coping ability and whether or not you can or can't cope with them. Uh, and that differs from a very well-off country or community to a not very well-off high human, it's a breakdown by human development index, which I'm gonna skip. Um, the interesting thing I think about vulnerability is that it's closely tied to emotion. And the reason I'm even going into all this discussion about vulnerability is that that choice to act, that second stage, if I said recognition, choice to act and act effectively, the only way people choose to act is if they feel vulnerable. They personally feel vulnerable. Otherwise, they're just recognizing that yeah, there's a problem. But if it's their vulnerability, then they act. They might not act effectively, but they act. Um, so this is a great example of vulnerability communication. So there was a huge heat wave, a lot of deaths in Europe, 2003, 50,000 people died around Europe. Um, 
after the fact, in one of the, the communication ways that people talked in France and Paris about the future and why it was an urgent future, five minutes left, I think I got that, uh, why it was an urgent future was because their temperature about 20 years out was gonna be the same temperature as Algeria. Ooh, yeah. You know, if you're a Parisian, that's just not a good thing, right? And, but it's more about the connotation of what Algeria is to the Parisians, less than the, the specific temperature. The other thing that I'd highlight is that we're becoming much more nuanced about how we think about risk. So risk isn't a singular event, it's actually an accumulated risk that happens as a series of events. So the San Francisco fire, uh, 1906, was sparked by an earthquake and poor building codes, building practices, behavioral practices, and a housing stock that was largely not prepared for fire and, a, and actually a community that didn't have good coping ability uh, to water down those fires. So it was a series of issues that gave rise to half the, half the city burning down, not the earthquake. And that idea of risk accumulation, that there's a domino effect from a first hazard to a secondary hazard and tertiary hazard, is actually something that very few people talk about. They talk about, okay, there's gonna be more tornadoes or there's gonna be more hurricanes. But that's not the issue. The issue is that end. So good examples in the Bay Area, we're definitely gonna have elevated, our Bay Area, not your Bay Area, you could say your Bay Area. Actually, this works pretty well for your Bay Area. Um, you're gonna have elevated seas, no doubt. You're in an earthquake zone. There's a high likelihood that if one of those barriers fails that you're gonna have significant flooding in an earthquake. So you get a levee breach, you have failed infrastructure systems, whether that's sewer, energy, and then that actually has cascading issues on economic and health system failures. So the risk isn't you have to rebuild the levee, it's about this other stuff that happens after the fact. In Los Angeles, high temperatures plus water scarcity in a non-resilient urban form, if you've ever been there, you know what I mean. Uh, in Honolulu, energy, water, and food import dependence. Um, in Minneapolis, retreating fee freeze lines, monocrops, and wooden structures, giving rise to issues with uh, bugs coming in. Um, in Japan, the, the earthquake, tsunami, nuclear, economic tourism collapse. In Louisiana, in New York City, it's a cascading series of events. In inland Europe, that 50,000 people that died, it wasn't, it was hot, but it wasn't actually that hot. They had relatively high heat index, they had non-resilient buildings, and they had cultural norms that said that people were on vacation. So people were on vacation and they left their grandparents at home and they died. And that, that wasn't everybody who died, but that was a lot of folks who died because they're, they're, the community structure to help people who were left behind wasn't, wasn't good. Uh, so there is a need to recognize, a need to understand vulnerability up in the upper right, that, that kind of scatter plot that I showed, and then, uh, and then moving from there to action, that's successful action. And I think I finish up here in just a couple minutes. Um, it's really important that that successful action is comprehensive and time-based. So you have building capacity. You can do that today. I'll give you an example in a second. Uh, siting appropriately, you better be doing that today because you're gonna be paying for it in the future. Building in passive survivability of buildings, whether that's daylighting buildings or putting in uh, natural ecosystems. Designing active, resilient systems, whereas this might be sector-based transportation strategy or buildings, um, this would be integrated systems. So how does the, ener the energy and the water system and the transportation, transportation system all nexus up together? Uh, five is allowing for flexibility and retrofit because 50 years from now, you're gonna have to do some things that are different from what you did today. How easily is it to change? And then that last one, managed retreat. That's a tough one. Um, I think I did, yeah, so I'm gonna show you the first one and the second one and then pretty much be done. So Katrina was a great discussion of building capacity. <coughs> Arguably the capacity to respond to that event in New Orleans, Canadian, American, just make sure I, you guys know Louisiana, right? Okay. Um, so uh, the capacity to respond was not what it probably should have been. It wasn't as fast, it wasn't as robust. That's something that was much better yeah, in New York. It was, there was much more preparation. Why is a big discussion, but... Um, the thing that I see that's interesting happening in New York right now 
is that it's doing, and actually it was in Katrina also, is that you're seeing number six play out. Whereas in some respects, number six in that six part diagram is 50 years from now for a lot of folks. It's now for other folks. It's now for people that were just hit by Sandy. So I don't know if uh, you have seen, but Cuomo came out with a, a buyout program for, for, com for the communities that were along the most vulnerable areas. So if you're within the one in 100 year floodplain area, 1% chance, right? One in 100 year floodplain area. Um, they'll buy you out at your original home value before Sandy struck. So they think, and it's going to cost about $400 million, and it hasn't been approved by the federal authorities, but it was proposed about a week ago. They think that about 15% of people will take them up on it. So what I think is interesting is that's, a, that's, a, that's an active resettlement move. What's going to happen after those 15% of people sell their homes and they're turned into parkland or marshland? That is going to be seen as a community largely in decline. So there will be a passive resettlement that will follow on the active resettlement. Um, and it'll be partly because of stories like this. This was a fabulous article in the New Yorker that came out. And I just pulled one piece of it, um, which I thought was extraordinary. So the saddest story of the hurricane occurred on Father Capodano Boulevard, when a mother got out of her stalled SUV and took her two young sons from their car seats and tried to reach high ground, the waves swept the children away. They were Brendan Moore, Condon Moore, four and two years old. If there were a typographic equivalent of a moment of silence, I would put it here. This is real, it's happening today, and uh, people are being relocated. So I think it's very valuable to continue this conversation, uh, not just today, but and what we're going to talk about just now. But we have, you know, we're trying to do the social media thing. So Facebook, if you want to join up, that would be great. Share your thoughts. Twitter, same thing. And I would gladly, if I can manage the commute and get wherever you guys are, I'd gladly have another hosted conversation like this at three different organizations or initiatives or projects or whatever. So I, I would offer that up. And I think that's that. Sorry, you can wow. take another picture. I know I just moved it when you did that. That's great. Nicole, I know others probably want to hear you talk for a lot longer, but Probably let's not. open it up for questions. And uh, let's see who has, who wants to be the first. This is the part I love, because we're all so shy. To, oh, Gordon, you're never shy. <laughs> Generational difference, boomers vis-a-vis -vis millennials. Comment. Uh, on the adaptation response, or just generally, what? what well, I should kind of ask you, right? How, where are you in that group? Oh. It's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I um, there's a lot of different ways to take that. I think that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, um, let me think about it for a moment. Does anybody have, since this is supposed to be a conversation, not a me, him, does anybody want to comment on that particular thing? There are some millennials in the room, probably. What about with respect to the model you're talking about of, you know, motivate, choose to act? Sorry, I have to do this. This is, we have to uh, speak into the mic because we're webcasting. There you go. Um, just with respect to motivating and choosing to act and adapting. Um, okay, so, so I think that there, there's some, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it maybe in a different way. I think that it's not so much to me about the generational differences as it is the, um, the connections between those groups. So if those groups, like there are generational communities, uh, sorry, boomer communities that are uh, only boomer communities. They, they are, say, a gated community. You have to be 55 years or older to live there. Those, the friend-to-friend -friend relationship in those communities is largely, the connections are largely of that, that it's almost like a monoculture. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say monoculture because I have friends that are in that, that space. But, um, but you know, they, that's who they're talking to. And they're, talking, they're sharing the same stories over and over again. Uh, millennials, same thing. They're at the coffee shop and there's no boomers at the coffee shop, right? So they're just, they're just circulating in that circuit. I think that what's really important is that the connections exist um, upward and downward, because one of the problems that I don't think, I forget if Jared Diamond de describes this, but is this, this problem of landscape amnesia. 
So landscape amnesia is the fact that we're all too short-lived, we should all live longer, and we don't do a very good job actually of intergenerational knowledge transfer. So if you, I think he does talk about this because he talks about um, what happened in Easter Island in Polynesia. And that was, was the stimulus of, of his original book was folks said, what an idiot, whoever that guy or gal was that cut down the last tree on Easter Island. Right? <laughs> Everybody must have hated him. Um, so, well, why would that happen? Well, the reality is in all, in all possible, it, it, the reality is that it probably wasn't a tree. It was a sapling. And there was only even a mythology at that point in that person's life of a time when there were great trees. So there were, there were stories, maybe, that had happened, but it wasn't the same place. It wasn't at the, the same time. And when you walk around your cities, even the, the millennial to the boomer, that may be 50 years, 40 years, 60 years. What is that difference in time? Something like that? 30, 40 years? Um, even that's too short, right? I mean, but if you talk to, like I remember uh, talking to a woman who, who remembered when in the 19, I think it was 1920s or 1930s, the uh, Cliff House restaurant at the end of uh, Geary Boulevard in San Francisco burned and, and fell. And that, to me, is a mythology. Like that, that, to me, is a, you know, I moved to San Francisco 15 years ago. That was a long, long time before that. So the idea that I, that I could even remember that place in time is, is different. But by creating that connection is very valuable. Sorry, I'm talking a long time no, about I'm, that. I'm going to move us along. And I just wanted to remind people, if they're joining us from web, webcast, they can do, do a to hashtag carbon talks, and we will get your question. Um, in terms of recognizing the problem and then motivating to act, are you seeing that with any of the companies maybe that Art works with or any of the work that you're doing? Because I, I know 50 years from now seems like a long way away, but I, I want to retire for that by then. So this will be my lived reality. Are there companies that are actually recognizing that like, the shit's going to hit the fan in our lifetime? I, I, th I think that there's, there's yeah, definitely, I, I actually think that the recognition is pretty widespread. The choice to act is less so, and then whether or not they're acting effectively, not just effectively, but most urgently, right? Because I think there's a lot of effective actions, but they may not be scaled to, to, to be great enough that they're going to be, have a difference. So um, even companies that, that people don't necessarily like for, for various reasons are recognizing. So Walmart is a classic example, right? Walmart creates a lot of attention in, in dialogue about what is sustainable and what is not sustainable, but they are doing amazing things from a standpoint of mitigation and adaptation. And they uniquely can scale that across a huge spectrum of assets, even up in the supply chain. So, so whether you'd like or don't like their, their social structure or their contribution to local communities or whatever, um, they're definitely a good example of people that are acting. So. And there are more like that, I think. There are a lot more like that. Hi. Um, I'm looking at this issue, and I'm uh, kind of, I guess, creating an affinity with, uh, between this um, policy decision making as well as um, whether to act or the impetus is for a you know, top down approach uh, to act, or should we begin on a local basis? Ah. I'm looking at it from scale and from policy making. OK, great. So, so, so that actually, I do have something to say about it. We're not going to stumble, I think, as much on that one. Um, so what the research actually out there historically has been a lot of top-down stuff, like global climate models, federal uh, statements, EPA coming out and saying things. Um, doesn't work, really, to get people to act. I mean, that, 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 that what, what, the, what the research says, and this isn't me saying it, the research says is that that does a great job of, of answering certain questions. Uh, is there an issue, is there not an issue kind of stuff? What, what's the time scale of the issue? But in order to get people to act, it needs to be local. So um, local and, and highly vulnerable. So if you look at um, the Netherlands, so the Netherlands, 1953, big flood, 1,800, 2,000 people died, um, levee breach. Netherlands is a, is a local community, right? I mean, that's not a big country, right? And when they breach, because so much of that country is below sea level, it's, it's a common vulnerability. So they can all agree to do something about it. So, so that the 
the choice to act and arguably the effective action is actually pretty easy for them. If you go to the United States or Canada, that's hard, right? I mean, you have very different vulnerabilities in Iowa versus in San Francisco. And um, so when you scale it up, you need to kind of, there is, a, there is a sweet spot on what that local size is, you know, whether it's a state size, you know, European Union um, nation, I don't know, but it, there, there needs to be an urgency built from, from uh, vulnerability. Question up here. Hey there, thank you very much for coming to talk to us today. Um, I wonder if you could comment on um, the, the problem between solving long-term problems in a society where short-term issues and um, short election cycles and, and that, that kind of thing are really what drives a lot of decisions. And I think that interferes with your motivation part of, uh, of your framework there. Yeah. Um, so, if, so I used to think I was brilliant. I, I went to a conference once and I said, I get it. I get how people make decisions. Uh, two thirds of decision making is irrational. One third of it is rational. So we're approaching decision making all wrong. We need to hire psychologists on all our teams and have them do things like this motivational framework or salesmen and kind of really tap into the, the irrational side. Um, another guy who was smarter than I was or wiser, uh, said that I had that kind of split right, but that I was wrong about how most decisions were made. Most decisions, he said, were the default, the default condition. And then, then there was the, like, the remaining 30%, 20% was irrational, 10% was rational. But most of it, 70% of it, was the default. What had happened before? Because you knew how to do it, you knew how to build it, you knew what to expect. Um, and that was really interesting to me, because then that you could see that as a negative or you could see it as a positive, which is that if you can use either rational or irrational frameworks to change the default, that becomes the new default condition, which means that it's easy to do that default over and over again. So a lot of the, the conversations, at least in the circles that I'm in, are about ratcheting up change. And um, the, you know, nobody would build a, a non-lead certified building in San Francisco. That's dumb. Right, or crazy or something because that's just, it's just the ratchet has shifted up and Cal Green has happened. And then if you combine that with um, kind of competitive motivations, then you get a, a, a growth curve that is not linear. It's, it's potentially exponential. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, one other thing, and I can't remember what it was. You were asking about policy. I can't remember what I was going to say. Did that answer kind of? Standing here I'm a little tired, so I'm not, I'm not kind of fully staying with you guys today. I apologize. Oh, no, you're, you're here. Um, so I actually wanted to ask you about LEAD. I see your LEAD AP status there. And um, I'm in the building industry, and so I'm curious about how this is going to happen operationally. Um, the conversation really seems to be shifting from sustainability purely towards resiliency, accepting that climate change is a reality, and we're already seeing the climate weirding that's happening, right? So is LEAD as a standard going to help us prepare for re resiliency? OK, great. OK, so that helps me remember what I was going to say also to you, which is that uh, it's not a zero-sum game, right? So the interesting thing, and a lot of the discussions are, is, is synergy, working togetherness. Um, so mitigation, adaptation, and public health, right? Those, there's actually a nice intersection between those three things. There are intersections between mitigative frameworks and adaptive frameworks. Um, heat island reduction is a good example of that. So if you've got heat island reduction, both you, you reduce your greenhouse gas emissions because you don't have to work as hard to cool, plus you've got a resiliency strategy. Uh, people aren't going to overheat when it gets hot as much. Um, so on to lead. Uh, the nice thing about lead is that it changes. It evolves. You know, it's established. It, it's being optimized, established, uh, expanded. Um, New things are coming out. Whether it will be the resiliency-based rating system, I don't know, or the, or the structure for a regenerative future, which is what this discussion I'm at today talks about, living futures, regenerative futures. Um, but I think LEED is already doing some stuff within adaptation and resilience. So if you talk about appropriate siting, that's a resilience, or a, I would say an adaptation strategy. Um, heat island reduction and adaptation strategy. So there's a lot of stuff actually in lead already that is kind of adaptive, you know, passive design of buildings. You could argue that elements of that are adaptive. 
Um, so I think that lead will play a role in that ratchet and that it does do some of it, but I'm not sure if it does enough and aggressively, as aggressively as it needs to. So there is a lot of discussion about resiliency-based rating systems for infrastructure, buildings, and cities. How do you, how do you compare resiliency? Thank you. With regards to the motivation issue uh, and back to the earlier comment about intergenerational differences, I mean, how do you motivate a group of uh, baby boomers who, who sort of have established their wealth and they're going to be retired for 30 years? Uh, so, and then how do you motivate them to work with younger people to solve some of these longer term solutions? Well, so, so I could say some people would say, and I apologize to any baby boomers, you let them die. Right? You let them kind of reach their, their curve, and the new curve comes in and is different. I think that's horrible. I would never say that. Thank you. Um, because I know baby boomers that care a lot about their kids and their grandkids and, and all that stuff. So I actually think I go back to that, that connection between communities. One of the, the interesting thing about this conference that I'm at today is that l there's actually a lot of it that is not about the stuff that you'd think. Like, it's not about... Um, zero energy or net positive energy communities or the next best thing in um, water systems or transportation systems. A lot of it is about community connections and how communities, when they're well connected, are more resilient, even if they have horrible infrastructure, are more resilient. Um, and I think the same is true about good planning. So communities that are well connected and kind of can emotionally connect so that the older folks can connect to the younger folks and see through a child's eyes. There's this whole thread about what's, how, what's the child's lens on a community um, that you're more likely to get effective decision making. So I, I think you tie them together through their relationships and their connections rather than say, they're all gonna die off and then we'll be all right because the new folks will come in and solve all the problems. I apologize, by the way, if anybody, if that freaked anybody out. Uh, well, thanks for all the insight that you provided today. Um, I'm just wondering, the reality is we do live in a society where people aren't connected in the way you're describing. I like the predominant part of society. Like, this is the society that we've kind of built, right? It's maybe the closest that we've had to what you're describing, or probably still have today, is in more, um, what, socialist... I'm not sure that's the best word for it, but uh, <coughs> socialist-oriented societies where yeah, people tend to have sort of more social values and they practice them. So I'm wondering how can we transition towards um, bringing more social connections into people? I actually, I, I don't, so I, so I just come from a different place. I don't know if I totally see, the, see it the same way. I think there are, I think the, the, the problem that occurs more often is that we don't respect the connections that they already have. So. So, um, so there's a good, there was a really healthy debate about the, the kind of last two chapters of the book because we were focused on how you design for certain types of climates, certain types of communities. We did hotter and wetter communities, uh, sorry, hotter and drier communities, warmer and wetter communities, temperate and coastal. Um, and that was dumb because temperate communities are kind of coastal communities. And it was all kind of approached from, a, from a, like an engineer's climate mindset, which was wrong. So in the end, we, we kept the hotter and drier and the warmer and wetter because that made sense. But then we changed the other to coastal and inland. And the interesting thing about coastal and inland was that coastal communities like San Francisco is more akin to Vancouver, is more akin to Shanghai, is more akin to London. They're heterogeneous. They, they have huge influxes of, of immigrants. Uh, they are, have a specific relationship to change. They change qu quick, quickly. <laughs> they change quickly. Uh, have a certain relationship to federal or state bodies that's positive. I would say, kind of, you know, come in. Let's talk about it. But then you look at inland communities, uh, which are kind of the opposite. They're more homogenous in their place, but they're more different the world over. And unfortunately, when you go into the inland communities, um, I think. A coastal community person would go into an inland community and say, well, this is what the federal government would like you to do. And the reality is that there's severe reaction to that, right? That, that's not, because they are, they are not in favor of change, generally. Uh, they have trusted local institutions, which they've developed connections through. So if you go through the local pastor or the local chamber of commerce, you're much more likely to do well than come in and frame it from kind of a, a top-down view. So my point is that there are connections that are there that aren't being seen and leveraged. Um, 
That's one side. And then the other is that actually I think there, there are greater and greater connections that are coming through things like Facebook and Twitter. So the social connection, the connections can happen pretty fast with the exception of some of the built environment that messes up connections like freeways and bad street networks and stuff. But um, connections can actually work pretty fast, pretty good. I'm, I'm a little more worried about the pipes in the ground, kind of the 50 year decisions that we're making, where we're putting communities. There's a great question, for example, about whether smart growth is resilient growth. Because smart growth tends to say dense, localized, and a lot of those dense local areas are coastal areas. Um, some of them are even right where the flood zone is, right? So there's, I think smart growth is resilient growth, but I think that needs to be nuanced. I think there, there's a, so, sorry, I got on a track, separate track. Thanks. I can talk about it later too, if you don't, because I don't know if I quite answered that. Hi, um, or, that, uh, just, uh, I just got an idea about that. I was wondering if in your book, I was wondering if you're in your book you've got anything uh, for rural communities because a lot of the uh, environmental movement focuses on on cities and a lot of um, um, the solutions focus on cities but when you look at rural communities and small uh, regional cities there really isn't a lot there and as someone who comes from a very small agricultural community um, and where there's not a lot of, of growth in, in terms of, of population growth and there's not a lot of opportunity to build new uh, infrastructure and yet those towns and regions are highly dependent on, on cars and there's not a lot that you can do there. So I'm wondering if, if you have looked at what we can do to make rural communities um, more resilient and get them, you know, cutting down on their their, um, their their fossil fuel consumption. Right. So yeah, I've got thoughts on that because I have family that are my family comes from North Dakota, Minnesota, and New Mexico. Uh, so I'm not coastal by by origination. Um, I think there's a few things that are interesting. One thing is that a lot of those communities are hyper resilient. Then don't make that Iowa example. That's part of the reason I put that in there. I mean, you can have fabulous resiliency in small small towns. One thing that, um, and I also don't necessarily think they have a poor greenhouse gas emissions profile necessarily uh, based, on their, based on what they produce compared to what they produce. So the one thing, the, the, the alignment that the book actually c comes to is that, and there's a graphic in the, in the book and the climate positive communities graphic, is that if you look at the productive capacity of different land use types, whether it's the, the urban, uh, suburban, or rural, that, and you compare that to the energy productive capacity, say like a photovoltaic array, um, cities actually aren't very good uh, at, at that. They have very high productive capacity, they're great generators of wealth and knowledge and, and such, uh, pretty bad about energy supply. Um, Rural areas are, are actually really good about productive capacity. They, they fulfill a very valuable role of, of agriculture and to some extent the mining and extractive materials, which is complex. But, um, and they actually have a very good energy footprint potential, right? I mean, you can get to net zero very fast in, in a rural community um, because you've got adequate space and, and building area. Suburbs, for who, people who live there, suck. Right, because they don't do either of those things very well. They're not localized. They, they contribute to large vehicle mile travel issues where people are commuting around. So we make an enemy out of the suburbs, but then say rural's great and urban's great for their own reasons. And we then try to uh, make a connection between urban and rural because there is this tension that, that kind of creeps into that and it's, and it's really not necessary. I mean, if you look at urban gardening, urban gardening shouldn't be there to, to displace rural ag. It should be teaching urbanites that agriculture is damn valuable and damn hard, right? I mean, you, there's no way you're going to feed yourself with your with feed a city with just urban gardening. And there needs to be densification of cities to protect farmland. 
So that relationship is actually a really good one. It starts to become re regionally restorative, which is some, a term that came up today, regionally restorative, not just neighborhood restorative. I'm going to ask a question. Um, one of the issues that we've been dealing with is we're looking a lot, we're working a lot with municipalities on green buildings and green built environment. Uh, the anecdote to so much on resilience, and this came up earlier in your question and also in the smart growth, the smart growth um, resilient, is neighborhood and neighborhood development. The issue here in Vancouver, so much of the neighborhood infrastructure, and this goes over to Gordon's question, is embedded in the kind of boomer culture of having a fair bit of wealth, having the one big yard and single family. And so that the kind of nimbyism that grows out of a neighborhood response next to what we need in terms of um, higher density to support transit center development, to support district energy, to help lower our emissions, all of that doesn't get considered in the context of a neighborhood conversation. So how do we marry this this idealism and value we put to neighborhoods as, as resilient you know, communities and the fact that most of the, the millennials don't live in those kind of contexts. They live in you know, rental spaces, in higher density areas, um, similarly with a lot of the immigrant communities. So how do we deal with that? Where's the, where's the starting point for change here in Vancouver on that issue? So that's really loaded in a lot of ways. I would, I would say you guys should, to some extent, have a discussion about it, right? I mean, if there was a follow-up, if there was a follow-up chat, right? I don't know how often you guys actually get together and not just ask questions, but actually talk to each other. That, that would be interesting. And there's actually a model that you could do in this room where you actually have four people, four chairs right here, and everybody sits around the edges as those four people talk. And then somebody on the edge can go up and you know, tap someone out and get into the conversation. And it's great. Samurai circle. It's great because you, you can listen. You can hear how people are framing. You can actually, you know, they, they all have their own emotional baggage and stuff. And you'll see it differently. And um, so I would actually encourage something like that for you to explore it. The, uh, and maybe, yeah, maybe I say safer that way. That's a whole new idea for a carbon talk. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that would be a fantastic carbon talk. Um, we always try and make sure that we start on time and end on time. And so I want to say a very, very special thank you to Cole for taking the time to be with us. I know that you've also offered to be here for others if you want to meet privately with Cole after this and just ask some questions. I know my book is somewhere up there, and, and Cole has promised to sign it. So, so please, uh, I want to ensure that that gets down before we go. I want to say again a big thank you to PIX, to the North Growth Foundation, um, and to my colleagues, uh, Chris Gully, Anthony, and our organizer and dialogue convener, Elodie Jacquet. So thanks so much, and um, we look forward to seeing you. Our next Carbon Talks is Mayor Richard Walton is coming on March 1st to lay out the mayor's option on funding public transportation. This is a highly contentious issue in this city as throughout this region, and so March 1st, here at 12.30, so please join us for that, and uh, please check us out at carbontalks.ca or our Twitter feed at Carbon Talks as well. Thanks again, Cole. Thanks, everyone.